All right, a pleasant good evening um, to, to us here in the class of steel this evening. You are very welcome uh, to join in with us. And, and this evening's class is going to be um, a lengthy one. We are focusing on the United Nations system and we want to equip you with information that is very relevant to assisting you in going forward. So this evening's class is specifically, um, the, and the next two classes is specifically dealing with the United Nations system. And my introduction to the UN system. So without any further ado, let me start our um, screen sharing and jump straight into this evening's class with us. Let me just share my screen with you. All right. So this evening we are going to be sharing all about the United Nations system and what the United Nations is all about, what is our part, why are we a part, and, and all of those questions we're going to answer uh, hopefully um, this evening to some degree. But before we do that, I, I think it would be fair of me in the class of steel to give you my introduction to the United Nations when I became interested, when I became connected, I want to share some information with you so that you will have a foundation that you stand on in understanding why is a bishop, uh, a Christian bishop, involved with the United Nations at this level, what brought me into human rights, dealing with peace um, negotiations and discussions, and all of those beautiful things that we um, are a part of through the United Nations uh, connection. So my introduction to the United Nations agenda, and, and I say the United Nations agenda because I, I have joined and, and aligned myself with an, with an existing agenda, uh, which kind of gels with my own personal agenda. So we have a bridging of agendas per se. So it started way back in 2001, actually, when I was connected to Dr. Mary Shuttleworth in the, in the United Kingdom in 2001, when she was pioneering the vision for you for human rights international and in 2009 we had the privilege of taking a barbados representative i was appointed as a honorary ambassador to the united nations and and i had the privilege of of taking an ambassador from barbados to the United Nations in Geneva. So I have been involved in mentoring you for quite a long time, um, very, very long time. And, and, I, and I chose this young man, Kevin Webster, uh, whom, whom I, I was privileged to take to the United Nations um, under the umbrella of Youth for Human Rights International. So here you see it was uh, exposing the youth to human rights in Barbados, uh, which will help in the fight to ensure that no one's rights are infringed upon in, in this country. I had a vision for Barbados, and this was a part of carrying out that vision. And, and you will see there in the photo with myself, we were actually in Geneva, um, Switzerland, is Matthew Wilson. Matthew Wilson, um, he was the um, 
working directly in the permanent mission of Barbados in Geneva. And he was working alongside of the ambassador to Geneva um, in Barbados, which is Trevor Clark in um, the United Nations. And, and here you see Dr. Mary Shuttleworth uh, with, with Trevor Clark, the uh, ambassador to Barbados uh, in the United Nations. That's when we met together in, in Geneva in 2009. I want to mention who Trevor Clark is. He's an engineer by profession and has held executive positions in the field of telecommunications, completing 41 years of service in engineering and management with the British Multinational Corporation Cable and Wireless PLC. He served as a director of several private and public sector companies in Barbados, including the chairmanship of the Barbados Investment and Development Corporation. He spent six years as Barbados' permanent representative to the United Nations in Geneva and special representative to the World Trade Organization at the level of ambassador. In March 2005, he was named Barbados' non-resident ambassador to ambassador designate to Japan. In 2009, he joined the World Intellectual Property Organization as an assistant director general with responsibility for the culture and creative industry sector, which completed two corporate treaties in Beijing in 2012 and also in, two, in Morocco in 2013. He also chaired the provisional committee on proposals related to the World Intellectual Property Organization development agenda achieving a breakthrough in the highly acclaimed development agenda aimed at mainstreaming development in the World Intellectual Property Organization's activities. He's a recipient of the year 2000 Barbados Centennial Honors and the Gold Crown of Merit for his work in telecommunications and investment promotion. So, So I had the I, I had the distinct honor of meeting with His Excellency Trevor Clark in the United Nations in, in Geneva, and that was for the very first time. Plug it. Here we see um, a photo with myself. Uh, this was when I was actually, this was in 2008, when I was appointed uh, outside the United Nations headquarters, where I was presented with my official appointment to the Office of Human Rights Ambassador for Barbados by Dr. Mary Shuttleworth, who was the founder and the president of Youth for Human Rights International. Dr. Mary Shuttleworth, she is a Nobel Peace uh, Prize winner. Mary Shuttleworth and You for Human Rights received the 2019 Peace Summit Medal for Social Activism in recognition of their work to educate the youth of the world on the importance of human rights through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The organization Youth for Human Rights has distributed more than 9 million booklets on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in more than 190 countries around the globe. Their human rights videos have been played on local television stations in 27 languages. Youth for Human Rights has conducted programs under the guidance of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Jose Ramos Horta, in Timor-Leste, Oscar Areza Sanchez in Costa Rica, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu in South Africa, and many other locations around the world. Dr. Mary Shuttleworth, and you can see the website that is there for those of you who would want to 
do your research on who His Excellency Dr. Michael Steele is, my association, and why I was involved in, in human rights. You can check the website, uh, which it is listed there, youforhumanrights.org, and you can check about Her Excellency Dr. Mary Shuttleworth, who is the founder and president. She was born and raised in apartheid South Africa. Mary Sutterworth saw firsthand the devastating effects of discrimination and a lack of basic human rights. As a teenager, she traveled extensively throughout Europe. During her studies and travels, she saw further discrimination and realized that issues of human rights violations reach far beyond the borders of her own country, South Africa. Certain that education was the long-term solution to improving conditions, Dr. Shuttleworth earned her doctorate in educational leadership and changed from fielding graduate university. The mother of two children and a proud grandmother, she started her first nonprofit corporation and private school in Los Angeles in 1998. Three years later in 2001, where herself and myself, we met in London at that time, she formed the nonprofit corporation Youth for Human Rights International. The purpose of Youth for Human Rights International is to teach youth about human rights, specifically the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights to rapidly expand the organization and reach youth around the globe, she has collaborated with like-minded individuals like myself and many others around the globe, groups and organizations locally, nationally, and internationally. The organization now has hundreds of groups and chapters in over 100 countries around the world. Believing in meeting with people in their own country to observe the issues they face and to encourage their efforts, Dr. Shuttleworth circled the globe annually since 2004, visiting over 70 countries. Meetings were held with top level dignitaries, including kings, presidents, prime ministers, and United Nations officials. The mayor of Los Angeles proclaimed you for Human Rights Day for the city of Los Angeles and other mayors have followed his example. Dr. Shuttleworth is the executive producer of the multi-award winning United Music Video, followed by the Youth for Human Rights Educator's Guide and other literature. Her actions in forwarding the cause of human rights have been covered by local, national, and international media, including radio, press, and TV. Throughout her efforts, she has reached millions of people across cultural and geographical boundaries, inspiring leadership through education. I want to confirm that I am one such individual who was privileged to be mentored and guided and instructed and, and taught valuable principles by herself, Dr. Mary Shuttleworth. And along with many other youth representatives from other countries at the United Nations where we went and go as a team of individuals to learn and understand and bond and develop projects, strategies, and plans to work in, 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 in ensuring individuals experience the understanding of their basic human rights. So you can see some photos there with me. Uh, I was involved in teaching with religious leaders. As a bishop, I, I shared as a, a Pentecostal minister um, teaching at an interfaith uh, service in, in Geneva. 
there you also see us with youth ambassadors um, while we were in, in Geneva also together. And all of those hands are our hands, the hands of our young people. It's not a photoshopped image. It is all of us who were at that event putting our hands together because we have endeavored that we will change the world. We will bring about peace, unity, collaboration, partnerships in the world, and we will make a difference. And I can equally confirm to you that many of those hands right there are global leaders as we speak. They're leaders of corporations, they're leaders in government, they're leaders in very high diplomatic circles globally, and we are all still very connected as very good friends to this very day. So I am in, in, empowered by reason of my connections to go to many countries at the invitation of personal friends who we have bonded in the purpose of the United Nations agenda globally. So here we see, and, and these are some newspaper clippings that I'm sharing with you, whereby I, I was able to bring high profile individuals into Barbados to assist in the promotion of human rights teaching, human rights education. It became one of my passions as a minister of the gospel, yes, but also as a humanitarian, I, I felt the need to teach working together with peace and unity, embracing each other for the common good of mankind or humankind, should we use that term. So here we see um, Nikki Lanik. Nikki Lanik is a, a race car um, driver, a professional race car driver out of Austria, who was one of the persons that was my um, good friend that I met in, in um, Vienna, and sorry, in Geneva. And I invited him to Barbados, among a number of the others who were gladly um, excited to join me in Barbados in the cause of promoting human rights education, education in Barbados. So here you see myself and, and Nikki while we were in Barbados. And one of the reasons why I have the passion in the class of steel for globalization is because this is where relationships are formed. This is where boundaries are broken down. This is where understanding of cultures, understanding of practices, and understanding of relationships are established. And, and, and Nikki and myself, we remain friends to, to this very day um, because of, of that bonding that we share in a, what a common goal or a common cause. And the class of steel is poised to do that for individuals globally. As a result of, of my opportunity to travel to the United Nations in, in, uh, in Geneva, meeting with global leaders, uh, youth that are involved in human rights, it stirred a passion in me as a young man to add value to the nation of Barbados. And as a result of that, I, I had the, the privilege of many years of working in the schools and, and in the education system in, in sharing and promoting human rights, promoting youth doing the right things the right way, mentoring youth in, in drug awareness, drug information, and all levels of mentoring where I had the privilege of sharing with youth in Barbados, which is exactly what we in the class of steel are going to be doing. I think the only difference is that we're going to be looking at establishing our own schools, our own universities throughout Africa and throughout the nations so that we could pioneer the work ourselves in making sure 
that we raise a next generation of youth who have an understanding of being globally relevant. All right. So I also had the privilege in Barbados of, of sharing with, with leaders, other community leaders that were working in the same areas as I was working in, in Barbados. And then it brings me to uh, one of the initiatives what pioneered a, a greater passion for, for Africa especially, which was um, focused on Nigeria especially. Here you see uh, my wife and myself, we were looking at setting up a human rights conference in Nigeria. And this was back in 2014 when we were putting all of these dynamics together. My father died in 2014, unfortunately, which hindered me from going to um, Nigeria uh, as a result of my father's death. And equally, my father would have died in 2014. I got married in 2014 to our be my beautiful wife, Jeannie, who you see there uh, pictured with me. And also our son, he was also uh, born in November of 2014. So 2014 was a very interesting year for us. But I want to assure you that my passion for Nigeria and Africa was birthed in, back in 2012, in 2012, when I was appointed to be the general secretary for the International Gathering for Peace and Human Rights. And, and here you see Human Rights Conference that was slated to take place in Nigeria back at that time. Just wanna share some foundation with you so that you kind of get an understanding and a sense of why I have the passion that I have in the class of steel. So some additional links for further information, uh, they're right there. You can copy those links and, and those links will give you a little bit more information because I want you to be very assured that the journey of human rights that I've taken and peace war that I've taken have been well documented globally and it is easily accessible. And, and, I, and I want those of you in the class of steel to, to have acknowledgement of something very important when we speak of being globally relevant. I want you to document what you're doing. That's why I'm showing you this. I'm not showing you this to show off or, or anything. I'm showing you this because I want you to recognize that your footprints are what going, are going to qualify you as you go through this journey as United Nations Peace Ambassadors. I want you to document events that you um, are a part of, events that you take part in. I want you to document them. I want you to look at newspaper clippings and newspaper coverage that you will receive and keep documents based on your journey. Why would I want you to do that? I think it is important that if you are going to be leaving a global impression, you're going to be making an impact on the nations, you would want to be able to follow up, engage yourself, and stick to what you said you were going to do. The journey that you are taking as a peace ambassador is a very serious one. And not only is it a serious one, but it is one that is going to bring a lot of ridicule. It is gonna bring a lot of op opposition, objections. You are gonna to have to determine for yourself, why are you doing it? Why are you doing this thing called being a peace ambassador? Why are you working in humanitarian work? Why are you working with the youth? Why are you working with the sustainable development goals? 
Why are you working with the United Nations? I want to speak with you today and give you some clarity that I hope you will take it on board. My personal reason is because I want to be the change that happens in the world. That's my reason. Why am I doing what I do with the United Nations? My personal reason, myself, Dr. Michael Steele, the reason why I'm doing it is because I want to be the change I see the world needs. I want to represent individuals who are less fortunate, less privileged, irrespective of their religion, irrespective of those things that we hold so dear to our heart, like our spiritual belief. I hold very dear my spiritual belief as a Christian and will never ever compromise it. And as a result of that, I believe that individuals have the right themselves to follow their own religious persuasion. I believe that. It's unfortunate that as the Christian church, we are sometimes found among others who believe that Yes, of course, we believe that, that Jesus Christ is the way. That's my belief. But my relationship with the United Nations and other organizations globally towards eradicating poverty, feeding the poor, creating an environment where there's education and persons are not illiterate, backward, and taken advantage of, looking at making sure that individuals have the right to play, looking at making sure that individuals have the freedom to speak in whatever persuasion they may choose to speak. As an ambassador, as a man of God, as a person, Michael Steele, as the head of the class of Steele, that's what we believe. That's what we are teaching. That's what we're promoting. And I, I continually say to those who follow and come close, I am not promoting my Christianity in the class of steel. I'm promoting the principles conducive to an individual living peaceably with all men in as much as is possible. The United Nations, there are many opinions about the United Nations. And here in this presentation this evening, I want to lend my voice to, I don't want to say represent the United Nations. Who am I? A small voice in the, in the midst of millions of voices. Who am I to say I want to represent an organization like the United Nations at its, with its stature and its ability. Who, who, is, who is little me, a drop in the bucket? But nevertheless, I will not allow that to stop me from representing. And here's what I want to share with you. I want to answer some questions. Why the United Nations exists? The United Nations is an international organization founded in 1945 after the Second World War by 51 countries committed to maintaining international peace and security, developing friendly relations among nations, and promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. Currently, the United Nations is made up of 193 member states. The United Nations and its work are guided by the purposes and principles contained in its founding charter, which I'm going to make available to all of you who are going through this class. I will make the UN charter available to you this evening. I'm going to post it to you. As a matter of fact, First Lady Jeannie will post that to you in the link in the class. 
She will put it in right now for those of you, the UN Charter. The UN has evolved over the years to keep peace with a rapidly changing world. But one thing has stayed the same. It remains the one place on earth where all nations can gather together, discuss common problems, and find shared solutions that benefit all of humanity. I want to share something on this point that is very important. A lot of individuals see the United Nations and they see the, the problems, the challenges, and the difficulties. A lot of individuals see them. And they are challenged with understanding the dynamics. Please allow me to share something here. The dynamics of the United Nations being involved in peacekeeping are so intricate that I would appeal to you as ambassadors to equip yourself with understanding the process of peacekeeping. Don't just hear someone talk about peacekeeping and not understanding the process. Not understanding the cultures, not understanding the dynamics of the organizations or the member states involved. A lot of times the peacekeeper a lot of times gets the blame for the problems that are being seen in the midst. Why? Because as a peacekeeper, we're the ones sometimes who go in and speak to those who are conflicting and having problems with an effort to cause them to see eye to eye. That's our role, to cause them to try to at least see eye to eye and create a peace for the higher good. That's our roles. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull a Christian card here as a bishop and ask a question. Are we not ambassadors and messengers of peace as Christians? Then it should be easy for us to function within the system of the United Nations. It should be easy for us. Why is it so difficult? It is difficult because we look at all the arms of the United Nations and we behave as though if you believe one arm, then you were responsible for all of those arms. Let me say this. I want to say this very clearly. There's not everything in the class of steel that all of you members are going to agree to. There's not. I don't expect it. But there is a foundational ethos that the class of steel has that is going to unite us all together in the same purpose and in the same goal. What I will say to us in being involved in the United Nations, there are many things that I will never be able to speak on or speak to. I cannot speak to, to nuclear, uh, nuclear energy and nuclear um, dealings. I can't speak on those subjects. I, I can't speak on disarming at length and, and, and different things that, that the United Nations is responsible for. I can't speak on it. I, I can't speak on, on climate change at certain levels. And, and there's so many things that I cannot speak on. But am I going to destroy those things that I can speak on because of the things I cannot speak on? Am I going to be silent on the things that I could be vocal on because the things that I rather not speak on, I am not speaking on? I want to charge you as individuals 
becoming peace ambassadors. If you are going to focus on being peace ambassadors, focus on that. Carve out your niche in the world of creating peace and focus on it. If you are going to focus on the educational arm of the United Nations, carve out your niche and focus on it. If you are going to focus your, your niche on human rights and, 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 and the dynamics of, of implementing and promoting, carve out your niche and focus on it. But please, don't create an environment of destroying an organization because of your displeasure or disapproval of a particular area of that organization. A lot of individuals label countries and they destroy countries. Are you going to destroy countries that, that because of the highlighted evils or atrocities that you see, you're going to destroy a country? Does the country not have youth? Does it not have those that are needful of support and encouragement and uplifting and opportunities to life? Carve out your niche in, in, the, in the United Nations and stay focused. We've listed the there are 193 member states. They're all countries that are signed as a part of the United Nations. I, I carved out my own little country, Barbados, and the date of admission for Barbados was in the uh, on the 12th of September in 1966. The 12th of September, 1966, Barbados was admitted to becoming one of the member states of the United Nations. There are 193 of them. We have not listed all of them, but the link at the bottom here, you can see the link at the bottom where you could write that link and, and, and you, can, you can share and find out where those other member states are, the, the others. But look at your country and see where your country was admitted um, as a member state, or if your country is a member state. So we're going to look now a little bit at the United Nations, our work. What is the work of the United Nations? What does the United Nations do? The United Nations maintain international peace and security. Let me explain to some degree what that means. There are 193 countries that are party to the peace relationship and treat and agreements of making peace. There are certain things that, that you have to do even in the midst of conflict. That, that is regulated. And somebody has to police that. Somebody has to monitor that. And the United Nations is the organization that does that. It monitors those, those things. That's why in, in the list of peace, uh, peace negotiations and, and discussions, et cetera, there are so many different arms. They protect human rights, deliver humanitarian aid, support sustainable development and climate action, uphold international law. How does the UN maintain international peace and security? Preventative diplomacy and mediation. Preventative diplomacy. You should take a note of that. What is preventative 
diplomacy. Preventative diplomacy is all about before there is a problem, when you foresee there's a potential problem, start negotiating and discussing with the potential parties, looking at building relationships, looking at, looking at fostering agreements. Right now, a lot of countries around the world have a 2030 agenda on sustainable development. Within those sustainable um, development goals are, are principles and, and treaties and, and agreements that are put in place. And ambassadors, peace ambassadors, and other ambassadors appointed are responsible for carrying out those mediations and, and those trainings and teachings and, and making aware individuals who are not aware or mindful. Peacekeeping. Peacekeeping, true peacekeeping forces, peacekeeping ambassadors, and discussions, trainings, um, teachings, all of these make up the peacekeeping arm and, and, and strategy of the United Nations. It's, it's wide. Peace building, building peace with nations, countering terrorism, creating an, creating an environment where we, we look at those individuals who cause terror, terrorize communities, terrorize nations, and to the best of their ability, our ability, because we as ambassadors, that's what we do, we try to create peace and counter the terror to come. One of the things that I say to a lot of us Christians and, and, and a lot of leaders is we can't at this time be on our own personal agendas to destroy somebody else's agenda to open doors whereby we're going to create a lot of conflict. And then you look and you realize, but wait a minute, when you try to come to terrorism, you're also creating conflict. So individuals sometimes look at those that are trying to create peace, sometimes can appear as though they're the ones creating chaos. As a matter of fact, even our religion as Christians, you would look and see that as a Christian, we're looking for peace. But it looks as though sometimes we just want to create chaos and cause problems. However, that's why we need to be skilled in diplomacy, in tact, in wisdom, in how we discuss, how we teach, how we share, how we negotiate, so that others would see that we truly come with the mask and the, and the staff of peace. We truly come with shalom. Disarmament. In our own small way, I have worked with gangs and, and gangsters for many years. And I can assure you in my own small little way, I have, I have caused a lot of individuals to be alive today without them even being aware that I was the one that intervened. But it was because of my desire to be a peacemaker, a peace builder, intervening in the midst of terror. All of you ambassadors and all of you who are interested in, in becoming peace ambassadors, you're going to have opportunities where you're going to do great things that persons and nations might never even know it was you. Peacekeeping and, and peace building is not about becoming popular. It's about creating an environment where nations can work together and find a common ground of existing, coexistence. 
I want to celebrate those of you who are in the class of steel. I receive a testimony of, of His Excellency Reverend Daniel Soporuo of his relationship with his Muslim community that is blossoming and is beautiful. Why? Because he started to look at it through different eyes. And sometimes that's all we need. We just need to look at individuals through different eyes. Two eyes that are going to cause us to, to love each other and work together in our small little area. Can I save the world? Can I deliver the world? Can you save the world? Can you deliver the world? Well, it is not always in our own personal ability. But it is in an opportunity where we can look at how best we can make our contribution. As peace ambassadors, you are going to be called to make your personal contribution. I'm going to stop here and we're going to pick this up next on, on Wednesday, but we're going to look at how does the UN promote and protect human rights and we're going to look at some more details within the United Nations um, system next class on Wednesday. But I want you to ask me some questions. Those questions that, that you have that others might have but might not be brave enough to ask. What is it you want to know? What would you like to, to, to know or what would you um, like to discuss about being a part of the United Nations? What are some of your fears? What are some of your anxieties? What are some of your doubts and worries and concerns? I want you to ask. Thank you so very much for for, for being a part of this class, but I want to, I want you to ask, I'm going to, as a matter of fact, I'm even going to call on you and, and I want to call, especially on our barrister in the house, because it is, it is good to know that we have those among us who are studied and learned and, and have the understanding of the dynamics globally. Your Excellency Anthony Uwesha is, is one of the peace ambassadors appointed to the United Nations. Your Excellency, what questions or concern do you have as a, as a newly appointed ambassador yourself? What questions or concern do you have, Your Excellency? Your Excellency Anthony good, Uwesha. Good, good, good evening, Your Excellency. Um, good evening, all the excellencies in the house. I'm very grateful for this teaching tonight. I personally want to thank our mentor, Dr. Bishop, Dr. Michael Steele. Um, this is a great one. It shows your heart. It shows, is a good heart. It's a good one that you taught about teaching us about um, the United Nations Charter, their beliefs, and the way they work. Um, I'm personally very grateful to you. It, it conveys a lot to me personally. Uh, my question would be this way. Um, uh, inside the teaching of tonight, you talked about the United Nations upholding international law. Um, I, I would want you to also buttress more on that. Um, how do they actually uphold international law and diplomacy? Thank you so much, Your Excellency. All right, thank you for that question. We are going to um, get into that on Wednesday. Um, which it is upholding international law, settling disputes between states. Um, yeah. That's one of the, the way that they uphold law. And, and also through the International Court of Justice, the I, um, ICJ, 
And the principal just judicial organ of the United Nations is the International Court of Justice. But, uh, but we're going to go into that in, in depth on Wednesday. Um, that's the stage that I'm going to take you into and, and talking about the, um, the court is composed of 15 judges. There are 15 judges within the International Court of Justice, but I don't want to go into those dynamics right now because I am going to be repeating myself on, on Wednesday. So on Wednesday's class, we are going to go into um, that aspect of the International um, Court of um, of justice. Um, so that's for Wednesday's class. But is there anything pertaining to this class that we shared on that that, that you have an interest in or you want to be aware of um, at this level, Your Excellency? Or is everything well with you? No, everything is perfectly well with me, well understood. Um, United Nations came into being in 1945 through their charter. That was after the Second World War and, um, uh, you know, made up of 193 countries in the world. And we are privileged in Nigeria to be a member of the United Nations. Yeah, the, the teaching tonight is quite explicit, Your, your um, Excellency. And I thank you so much for this teaching. God bless you. All right. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, um, on the behalf of, of Uganda, um, I want to ask our COO, her Excellency Doreen uh, Burundi, who also is an appointed uh, peace ambassador to the United Nations as well. Your Excellency Doreen, uh, what is your take this evening? Do you have any questions, any observations, or anything you would like to, to mention or get more information on thus far? Um, thank you, your, uh, your Excellency, Dr. Bishop Michael Steele, for the wonderful uh, insight of our Peace Ambassador appointment. Um, well, I am speaking on behalf of all the new members, on, of all the new ambassadors. The class of that tonight's class is actually an opening door for us to be able to understand exactly what our credentials hold. And I, I thank you, I want to say thank you so much for bringing this uh, topic in the class of steel in such a time, because we have so many people that are joining the class of steel, they are looking forward to becoming UN Peace Ambassador and you are feeding us with more information that we are going to be able to share with them. Like for me in Uganda, I have many of my friends, uh, they are so excited for me and they want to join. So you have given me uh, at least information that I'm going to be able to share with them and I will encourage them to attend more of the class of steel so that they can understand what they are going to get themselves into. Um, um, I have also, thank you for sharing your experience because many people have been uh, asked, you know, they've been checking you out. <laughs> they want to know whether you really uh, uh, um, represent the UN, uh, uh, UN United Nations. And I'm glad that you have a lot more of information about the United Nations and you have evidence, you have your history, you have your documentation that is that is uh, that that we uh, that we can use to show our 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 intended ambassadors who want to join to actually give them the confidence that you are the right person and the right mentor for the UN Peace Ambassador. With that being said, I will fall, I borrow a leaf from it that in the coming years that I will be able to uh, keep my documentation of my activities as the UN Peace Ambassador as evidence for, for, for now and for the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Michael Steele. May God bless you. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency uh, Doreen. Um, one of the things that I will I will share with you is 
His Excellency Dr. Philip Finn, the Honorable Dr. Philip Finn, who has uh, appointed a number of our ambassadors to the Word of Life Ministries International. One of the things that is established is, is you would want to use the term always learning. You never know, you never know everything. And in as much as you, you find yourself as, as a student or someone who has now acquired a, a, a level of acceptance into a family, and I use the term family, ambassadors for me globally are family. Wherever you are found as a peace ambassador, you're a part of a global family, a global community. You're respected, you're, you're, you're esteemed highly, and, and you're considered. And the United Nations does that for us, not to us, for us. Being a part of, of any of those bodies that are focused on, on peace and unity gels us in that family, there, there are many organizations, there are governmental organizations, there are non-governmental organizations, there are private businesses and corporations that are all plugged into the United Nations system. And they all work on those sustainable development goals, those initiatives that bring us together under that one umbrella that says we are one. Some of the organizations that are a part of the UN, you, you might not celebrate them. You might not celebrate what they do, but you are a part of the bigger family that does the higher common good, yes? And, and I want you, His Excellency Dr. Fain has given instructions to, to a lot of you uh, newly appointed ambassadors to, to go and register your credentials with your local police, with your, with your local uh, organizations um, that, you can, that you can lend value, add value to your communities. Because at the end of the day, you are equipped as an ambassador to add value. I have done over the years, if I share all of the things that I do, a lot of you might say, oh my God, now I see why he does what he does. But my wife and I today just decided we're going to pick out a, a few little things that I have done, but I've traveled extensively around the globe. Uh, I've traveled extensively to the United Nations, both in Vienna, to New York, to Geneva, uh, to Geneva, I, I've traveled, and, and, and I've also been trained in, in so many different disciplines. I was an advisor to the Metropolitan Police in Scotland Yard here in the UK, so I don't want to blow a proverbial trumpet as though I am greater than anybody else. All of us are increasing our ability and our capacity to be useful. Are you with me? Come on, give me a wave if you get what I'm saying. All of us at, at different levels. And I want to challenge you to get in the media. Let the newspapers know about you so that you have credible references of who you are and what you do. Make sure that you are recognized and observed because as you grow, just like you rightly say, Your Excellency Doreen, Persons are going to want to know what gives me the authority to speak. What gives me the authority to speak as an ambassador? Your Excellency Doreen, I don't want you in three years' time speaking on my authority. I want you speaking on your own merit. I want you speaking on the fact that you've been to, to Geneva or you've been to New York or, or you've engaged training with the United Nations. You've sat in the class or still under the tutoring and, and my mentoring and, and that's where you remain consistently knowledge and, and growing. That's what I want for all of you. That's why the class of steel is going to be continually teaching Monday, Wednesdays and Friday until whenever. Why? Because you will never know everything there is to know. And you will always be able to see it from another angle. And there will always be opportunities and initiatives that are going to come up that are going to be new.
innovative, that are going to add value to you and your country. So I don't just want persons do, getting an ambassador appointment or, or getting a badge and then going and hiding and then running around thinking they have reached. You've not reached. You've only just begun. I, I want to ask on the behalf of Ghana, Her Excellency uh, Bishop Dr. Comfort Adu, Bishop Comfort, do you have any comments on today's session or any thoughts or questions? And we're bringing Ghana in because I hope you see the class of Steve. I don't see Doreen as Doreen or Bishop Comfort as Bishop Comfort. I see you as your country. That's how I see you. And I hope you see yourself that way as well as an ambassador. Bishop Comfort for Ghana. Yeah. Thank you, Your Excellency Bishop Dr. Michael Sir. May the Lord bless you and then continue to uplift you of all that you are doing for us. And I greet all the Excellencies and everybody in the house. It is true, when I joined in and uh, saw how you were sharing uh, your experiences uh, with the Peace Ambassadors, I thought to myself, oh, you know, when I was in the Union, Within the early part of maybe, maybe let, let's make it 80 to the 80s to 23, thereabouts, we had a group in the, in the country called Human Rights. Human Rights, ahead. and I was part of that. We were uh, taught about uh, um, maybe children being raped. Uh, female uh, disturbances and things of that sort that goes on. Little did I know that there will be a time that I'll be involved in a much greater uh, work on peace, uh, much as it is in connection with the uh, United Nations. And I saw the seriousness in the whole issue. And it is true that it is good when you record your experiences and uh, after recording experiences, it will help you to know how to move forward. You will know your mistakes, you will know your aspirations, you will know your vision where you want to chart your, 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 your global peace uh, issues. And I salute you, His Excellency, uh, for the, the, the work you have done to us for us this uh, evening. In fact, you have shown that, yes, you know what you are doing. And if you are following a mentor who knows what he or she is doing, it's a big plus because you will never fall into a ditch. He, he has uh, charted that area and he knows uh, where to part, uh, uh, part, uh, partner with. He knows where to move with. He knows where to direct uh, us to. I think uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. And to all the class of steel, what I will say is that uh, we must continue to uh, always be in the class of steel. It is, I, I find myself that even when I'm so tired, I can't do anything, and it's time for class of steel, like today. I have been in meetings upon meetings the whole day, but I thought that I don't, I don't want to miss the class of steel. And if today I had rested, I would have missed this lecture. It's very powerful lecture for us. Thank you again, Your Excellency. And thank you again, uh, Your, Your uh, Excellency, the First Lady, who has also guided you to pick up some of the things that we need. It is always said that beside, I, I use this word, beside the successful man is a woman, right? <coughs> Your Excellency, I, I want to repeat it. I say beside every successful man is a woman. So as we are giving you the top up, we are also giving the first lady. In fact, I'm very proud of her. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Well, uh, I, I want to- But there's a question I, I wanted to- Go ahead, please, your question. Please. There's a question I wanted to ask. Yeah, with this uh, Global Peace Ambassador I mean, to the United Nations and the human uh, rights or the shrug that is in 
every country, what does it, how does it uh, uh, reconcile or how does it uh, work together? Is it different or what, what are we supposed to do with that? That's well, the question I wanted to. Okay, the United Nations have many arms. Peace is one of, um, peacekeeping is one of those arms. Human rights is another arm. It's also another arm. And, and you decide. When I was a, a, a peace ambassador, uh, sorry, a human rights am ambassador, a human rights, I'm going to be very honest with you because I'm your mentor and I, I owe it to you to be honest. Being a, a, a human rights ambassador can be very, very um, controversial as a bishop, extremely. And, and the reason why it is extremely controversial is because there are some things that we, we have to allow individuals their rights to do and, and, and allow them, not, not celebrate and embrace, but allow them that are not conducive to our personal characters or our personal standing in life. And, and that was one of the, the, the harder lessons to learn. How can you allow somebody to do something in their own sphere of, ex, of, um, of influence that you do not approve or agree to? And, and, and how can you do that and, and have a clear conscience? And being a human rights ambassador, you have to make some serious determinations yourself. I don't want to go into the details of that, but because I don't want to, to isolate any particular um, dynamic or tenant within the, the human rights uh, agreements or understandings. But what I will say is that you're going to have to look at your, your conscience. You're going to have to look at your personal um, calling. You're going to have to look at your personal opinion. And there are times that you will have to agree to disagree. And there are times that you will also have to not embrace others because of decisions that you've taken. And, and there are times that you will have to be walking a, a, a line on your own. But you have to walk according to, to how you choose to, to, to walk. It's an individual thing as a human rights ambassador. As the peace ambassador, it's the same thing. There are some things that you might look and you might have an opinion on who's right and who's wrong and who should be reprimanded or who should be um, charged or whatever. But, but, but you're gonna have to determine yourself as a negotiator or as a diplomat or as the person who's going to be trying to bring peace, for example, Bishop Comfort, if you have a comfort, a conflict with, with His Excellency Anthony Uesia, I love His Excellency Anthony Uesia, and, and, and I love you. And His Excellency Anthony Uesia's approach might be right, and your approach might be wrong. And, but my interest is not in whose approach is right and whose approach is wrong. My interest is, hey, don't let this discussion or this negotiation cause lies unnecessarily. Don't, don't let this destroy communities or families unnecessarily. How can we best create an infrastructure of communication that there's not a lot of collateral damage, if you get what I'm saying? How, how could we foster a relationship that you walk away with as less collateral damage as possible? Now, to answer your question on the part of human rights and, and the peace, how does it work? It works how you choose to work. It's your personal... It's your personal walk that determines what level of interaction you're going to have. You are in government and, and you have to determine how am I going to use my wisdom and my, my newfound opportunities to add value? Am I going to do some trainings? Am I going to bring in teachers? 
Am I going to engage the UN system and see what the United Nations is offering and, and speakers and individuals who will, of course, be willing to come and, 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 and raise awareness of whatever that particular area that you're focused on in your country? All of those things you have to decide as an ambassador for yourself. All of you should be looking at the UN system and thinking, okay, good, how can I add value? Those of you who have companies, how can I add value to my company? Can my company implement sustainable development goals? There's 17 of them. Which of them can I implement that will cause me to be working within that system that will be respected and honored by those globally in those 100 and something countries that are represented within the United Nations? So all of those are things that you do on your own in your own determination of going forward. That's up to you. There is, you, could sit, you could put your badge in your pocket and do nothing. It's up to you. Or you could, you could decide, you know what? I am done doing what I was doing and I'm just gonna go on the path as an ambassador for peace, as an ambassador for, for diplomacy and, and conflict resolution. And I'm gonna bring all people into my country and I'm gonna spend the rest of my life helping those build schools and education. It's up to you. It's your own choice. I can't tell you do what I've done because what I've done is out of my love for, for the youth. I have a sincere passion for the youth. And, and that's why I did what I did. So, and then on a particular note about that you mentioned, behind every successful man is a successful woman. I want to say uh, irrevocably, I, I want to say thanks to Her Excellency um, Jeannie. And by the way, um, Her Excellency Jeannie um, has been an appointed ambassador um, to organization within the United Nations for so long now, but she stays behind the scenes so quietly. And she's twice a, a, an ambassador to the United Nations, twice. And, and I want to acknowledge her wisdom in putting these classes together, the PowerPoint presentation. It is her, she's the boss. She's the one who makes this happen, and, and I want to celebrate her. So let me let her take a, a, what you say, a virtual bow. Your Excellency Jeannie, um, can you unmute my darling? Good, good night to everyone. Your, Bless your, me to you all in your families. Good, good evening, my dear. Uh, we just want to officially thank you for a, a wonderful first half um, of presentation, and and it was it, it was well received. We do appreciate so much your input and your contribution to making the class of steel a success, ma'am. Because I could not have done it without you, uh, and I appreciate you very much, my darling. Thank you very much. Thank you also to Bishop Comfort and all the other members. I appreciate, I appreciate your kind words and I appreciate the love and it is my absolute pleasure. I, I enjoy putting everything together. I enjoy doing the research. It is, it is an absolute pleasure to do it for you guys. And it also makes me happy when it blesses you and you're filled with the knowledge any understanding that can continue to propel you forward in whatever area that you are endeavor to, to undertake. I wish you all continued success all the time. I love you all and God bless. God bless you all very much. <laughs> all right, my darling, thank you so very much. I, I want to ask uh, His Excellency Paul of Denver if he has any questions on this evening's class. And thank you all for your contributions. And, and I just want to acknowledge our YouTube and our LinkedIn and our Facebook family, those who are listening in uh, to this broadcast this evening. Thank you so very much for being with us. Your Excellency Paul Ndemba, uh, please, uh, your question or your comment. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Bishop Steele. And good evening to everyone, all the excellencies in the house. This particular lecture has been very enlightening and informing. 
there are some people that I will have brought to the class of skill because of their caliber. But it was at that time that the UN released a particular newsreel. And because of it, they said no, that they are Christian. But with this kind of information that has come out today, yeah, I said it's informing because most of us did not know that there are a lot of departments in the UN. You can choose to be in whichever one you like because the UN has this popular name of being the 666. So a lot of Christians don't want to have anything to do with the UN. In fact, I had that challenge also myself some time ago until I started reading up some small things. So I want to say thank you very much for this particular one. It was timely and informing. God bless you. You know, Your Excellency, uh, Paul, I, I, want to, I want to commend you for commenting, and I'm going to be very honest with you. A lot of times individuals sit behind and they have a negative opinion and they secretly stay in the background and dissuade others. And, and a lot of times they, they dissuade others and, and when wise individuals look at them, individuals could say they themselves are unlearned, uneducated or unwise. And, and I thank all of you in the class of Steve who take the time to, to learn. We all are learning. My wife and, and I today, while she's doing her, I love when, when, when we're doing research together. These classes for me and my wife are, are twofold. They even bond us together as a husband and wife more because we have so much fun putting them together as a husband and wife team. We do it ourselves. And, and we, are, we, we sometimes have discussions about the presentation and the discussion, how it should go and all that, because I'm a perfectionist and my wife as well, but she thinks her perfect is perfect already. And we have fun doing it. But Your Excellency, one of the things that I will say to you is you have to find a team that is like-minded because you will find yourself in a jungle of individuals who are contrary to your thinking about the United Nations or other organizations, and you will never endeavor to do anything successful with some organization because of some people's opinion. I personally had problems when I became a peace ambassador as a, 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 a human rights ambassador. I had challenges. And when I went to, to London and, and I was pulled into being an advisor, I was in, involved in being an advisor to Scotland Yard, the Metropolitan Police. This is gonna be really funny. But I sat on, on, on that committee that had gay, lesbian, and bi's and transvestite community represented. I sat on that community that had Muslims. I sat on that committee that had all levels of individual. And me from my Christian background, it was hard. I, I remember, I'm gonna be very honest with you when I'm talking to you as individuals who are Christian that you might have problems. I'm, I'm talking to you genuinely. And I had to recognize that if I am going to be able to lend a Christian voice to a global discussion. I have to be comfortable in my skin to sit and represent myself and allow others to represent themselves. Come on, wave at me if you get what I just said. Wave at me. If you get what I just said, wave at me. I say to individual, why are you going to bastardize a government or a system and when you look at it, you do not have a representative in the system. How could you bastardize a system that you want to bring about change in the system, but you're not, in, you're not involved? How could you? You can't. Because when decisions are made, decisions are made based on those who, those who put pen to paper and, 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 and put in the documents and submit them where? At that table. That's where the decisions are made. So a lot of individuals who refuse to go to Harvard University because there's a principle that they don't like, 
or there's somebody that they don't like, as far as I'm concerned, they're unlearned and uneducated and unwise. Are you with me? So, so my suggestion is this. The United Nations has all levels of arms, all levels. There are things that the United Nations is going to approve. The United Nations is not a, what's the right word? A law unto itself. Those things are approved by your governments and, and those people who are your legislators and, and, and legislators that are set in those seats and make those decisions. And then it gets passed through the assembly and then it gets approved. Are you with me? The human rights thing that I have gotten approved for Nigeria, that persons don't even know that I am the person that worked in that environment as the as the, the, the secretary general for the International Gathering for Peace and Human Rights. I was a general secretary. And, and there are things that I got approved. There are individuals who were incarcerated or who had problems, international uh, conflict, and, and I was part of writing documents and negotiating on the behalf of those people being delivered from potential chaos. So when you become involved in a system like the United Nations, there's so many things that you could do to add value to your country, add value to your community, add value to your nation. But guess what? You can also add value to other countries and other nations. Why? Because you join with others and you agree, let's put a halt to these atrocities. Let's put a halt to these things and let's put our voice to it. Don't sit down and be like others that are crying out at what is happening. Be a part of the solution. And that's what I have chosen to do, to be what? A part of the solution. So your excellency, uh, Reverend Paul, I want to commend you. And, and you're one of my hardest critics. You know I know you're my hardest critic because if you're not convinced, you're not going nowhere. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Life is not about being convinced. Life is about learning and adapting. And there's some things that you will agree wholeheartedly on, but some things you will agree partly on. Those things that you mutually agree on work together. And those things that you don't agree on, find a common ground of, of allowing each other their right. That's my, I, I hope that that has added value to, to your thought, Your Excellency uh, Apostle Paul. Yes, thank you very much. It has done that. I agree with you completely. For as long as we are living, it's not everything we'll agree upon, but we have to find a common goal to agree and so that the world will continue to move on. I agree with you. Thank you. And God bless you. And, and remember this, the United Nations, and, and here's something interesting that I will tell you. You always need a mutual ground where every person could go that they will not have troubles. How many of you know that the United Nations in, in Vienna, Austria, that when you go on the United Nations, your passport is now a different boundary. When you walk into the United Nations, yes, the reason why persons can have diplomatic clearance is because if they're from fled from a country that has potential conflict or disapproval, when they're going into the United Nations, they pass through that international airport with diplomatic clearance. Nobody speaks to them. Nobody, there's no identifying that airport. Because why? They are focused on going to negotiation. And they are ushered to the United Nations headquarters. Because once they're in the ground, are you with me? That's what a diplomatic passport does. It puts you on neutral ground so that while you are there, you are, you are recognized and respected. And nobody is going to attack you in that neutral ground. When you come to that neutral ground, you come there with the intention of negotiating. You might disagree. You might, might leave heated and you might have a hundred and something sessions or a thousand sessions before you come to a common ground. But the point is, 
is that what well, you are sitting there and discussing on neutral ground. The one is not going to fly into the other's country because then there will be chaos. I mean, if you get what I'm saying. But when you go to the UN assembly and meet, that's where it is neutral ground. And then what happens is you hear countries saying there was a peace meeting where the president of this country went into that other country. But mind you, prior to that happening, there were months and months of discussion at United Nations headquarters but to get them to agree, to let the world see that they are willing to work together. Are, are you with me? That they are willing to allow this president or this king to come on their land and they do not assassinate him or take him out. Why? Because the discussions have gotten to a place where there is peace and they can come together. Uh, that's just, by the way, a little bit more information. Your Excellency Donald Ewers, uh, one of our peace ambassadors and also my chief of protocol. Do you have any comment or submission for this evening's class, Your Excellency? A pleasant good evening, Your Excellency, and to all the ambassadors. Yes, sir, I would just like to add on to what you've said. Um, I've worked in uh, mental health for 25 years and some of the, the terms and conditions that they asked me to do was my Christian faith doesn't allow me not even to think it. For example, to go, the first time they asked me to go and visit a racist man, don't like black people. How can I say to my superiors, I'm not going to that man's house? They asked me to go and I had to, to, to go to his house. Uh, a person who is um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, all the different uh, isms and kisms, when they ask you to do things and to go out, I'm talking within my work circle. I can't say no, I have to. I have a job, I have a responsibility, and I have to go. I'm saying all of this to say that I've learned so much. I'm really glad that I came with you, sir. And I salute you with what you're trying to say to us with the class of steel. And as an ambassador, everything that you said, you put it in action, showing how to speak to people, how to present yourself, how to adorn yourself, the entire, the, your, your, the, the, your clothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And everything that you say and saying now, it makes sense. Because as, as an ambassador, some of the areas that we'll be going into and to represent and to speak, it will go against, should I put it, our Christian faith. And so we have to use wisdom in a lot of things. When I went on the street to feed the homeless, if a person who is gay or a person who is Muslim or a person, I can't say I can't feed them. I had to feed everybody. So there's a thing that we have in Britain where they call, you cannot discriminate against anybody. So with United Nation, that is in even more so. I am not telling that you must um, water down your salvation, but you have to use wisdom. And so therefore, sir, I, I agree with you what you're teaching us and with my experience and what I've seen, what I've learned from Dubai and what we are learning with the United Nations. So yes, we have to step up the mark. We have to know our facts. We have to know why we are doing it. We have to know uh, it's not a show, it's not to show off, but it's a humanitarian. And one of the things I like with the class of steel and why I'm doing it I'm coming from the humanitarian complex. That's why I'm feeding the homeless. Everything that I'm doing, you've just add on to what I'm doing. Working in the community, working with mental health, working on homelessness, working constantly with people. And so therefore you have to have a wide spectrum of everything to address the situation as we go along. Um, uh, some of the things, uh, my granddaughter's school 
is the headmistress is a lesbian. She's implementing sexual education at a very tender age. And a lot of parents were totally against it because what she believes in, she's imposing it in the school. And so we, you can go there and agree to take out of the sexual education lesson or classes or whatever, teach um, parents of write the letter and so on. However, the society that we live into is changing dramatically. And so I, as a, a peace ambassador, we will come across these things and we must be aware how we address it. You can't um, speak in tongues. You can't be speaking and rebuking the devil because that's not going to work. You actually probably lose your job for that. Um, um, I remember um, I used to put on functions, um, ha Halloween. Halloween is the dealing with the night of the witches. It's a big thing in, 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 uh, in, in the UK and America. And I remember some, I have some of my um, colleagues were speaking in tongues because I put on a Halloween party for the mental health clients. I don't believe in Halloween. I don't believe in the witches, but this is what they want. I've come out of it and I've retired from my, and uh, but they carry on with the Halloween, but I don't believe in Halloween parties. It's not my thing. It's not, you know, it's just another story. I'm not going to touch that, but I'm just trying to highlight and adding on to what you say, sir that a lot of things will be very uncomfortable. However, we have to carry on as peace ambassadors. Bless you, sir. Your Excellency, thank you so very much for your submission. And I will give you a thought. I will give you a thought over the years. One of the things that I have learned, and a lot of you might look at me and, and you'll discover it, and you're in my class, the class is still, so I'll share this one with you. And, and this is one that you must, you must all of you in the class of steel, I hope you learn this one from me. If there's anything you learn from me, learn this one thing. Learn how to keep a straight face while inside of you might be warring and internal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can sit quite comfortably and you can be listening like this. I'm going to be honest with you. I listen sometimes and individuals are looking at me for a response and they will never find a response in my in my, my, my appearance. And the reason is because I have learned over the years how to take my personal opinion. I don't even allow my body, my body expressions to show my disgust, my disdain, or my frustration. Anytime, anytime that I show my disgust, frustration, or disdain, it is deliberately so. But sometimes you're sat in forums and in meetings where you, you cannot, you know, when it, the cameras are on you, persons are looking and somebody gets up to speak. You can't be. You, you, you have to learn to professionally observe those that are contrary to you in opinion and just allow them the opportunity to express themselves openly. You have to learn that. That's a skill, but you're going to have to practice it when you're sitting in meetings discussing with individuals that are contrary to your personal opinion. You have to learn it as an ambassador and a negotiator. And I'm going to continue to challenge you in the class of steel to get that attribute added to you and in your character. Because it's, it will be helpful. As a matter of fact, it will save a lot of potential fallouts if you learn how to do that. Because if you show the wrong facial expression or disdain to the wrong person at the wrong time, you could break up a whole international discussion because you were seen as the ambassador and you should know better than to express whatever that negative expression that could cause disruption in the negotiation. Wave at me if you get what I'm saying, please. Thank you so very much. When you go to, when you go to, to Muslim countries, 
keep your Christianity to yourself. <laughs> Mind your own business and celebrate the culture, love the people, and ask God to give you an appetite for beautiful cultural experiences that you've never had before. Why? Because you will open yourself to meeting some of the most wonderful, humane individuals that you might ever come across. And if you devoid yourself of that opportunity, you waste your calling as an ambassador. One of the successes that I can declare is that I have absolutely no conflict or issues with any person, whoever they are. Why? Because I've learned to allow individuals the right to be themselves, just like I am being myself. Your Excellency uh, Daniel Sapuru, please share your thought this evening with us. I see you there smiling, but we're going to wrap up soon. But it has been a wonderful discussion. Thank all of you for your, your contributions. Your Excellency Daniel Sapuru, on the behalf of Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for the lecture tonight. Um, obviously, we have learned a lot of things, uh, especially concerning being peace ambassador. I, I am actually looking forward to uh, the remaining days, and that's um, when you would uh, present um, when you will present um, the remaining talks. Like for instance, um, you, you talked about today, you talked about uh, maintaining international peace and uh, security. Uh, maybe Wednesday, we would be looking at uh, uh, protect human rights and, uh, and so on and deliver humanitarian aid and of course, upholding international law. Well, we are looking forward to uh, seeing that or to hearing what you would tell us. However, I would like to ask a question. <laughs> and uh, well, this is, this is just for clarification. You, you, you just told us about maintaining international peace and security. Now, when a country uh, does not have uh, security. When uh, everywhere in the country there is insecurity, uh, does um, does the UN you know, have anything to do with that? Would they would they would, would, would the UN come in and talk about that? Like for instance, when you were talking about uh, maintaining international peace and security. You, you, you talked about um, uh, disarmament and you also talked about uh, peace building and, um, and uh, peacekeeping. Now, when I am asking this question because I am in Nigeria and um, there, there is a lot of insecurity in this country. Many people are killed on everyday basis and so on. And uh, you'll find out that uh, it has actually been ascertained that those doing this killing are foreigners. Um, our borders were thrown open to them and they came in and uh, they are bringing in security. Does the UN have anything? Uh, I mean, can they come in? and uh, try to um, protect people and talk about this so that the government can hear and do something. It's just a personal question, although I know that uh, uh, this is a very uh, place. So thank you very much. Um, I would like you to at least tell us one or two things about this. Um, or doesn't the charter of uh, uh, UN cover a thing like this, coming into a country and uh, telling the, the government what to do to, to bring peace and so on. Thank you very much. I'm listening. Well, you, you, you've given me a challenge and I'm going to, um, I, I was listening and I was going to say that, um, 
that might be a personal conversation. But then I decided, you know, th there is nothing personal when individuals want an answer and they also want to have an understanding of, of the dynamics that are involved. So I'm going to answer you, and, and I will use the term, I'm going to answer you this way. And I want you to read between the lines. Um, mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason that might, might be, I, I want you to read between the lines. You see that His Excellency Dr. Finn and, 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 and myself, we came to, to Nigeria and, and you see that we're establishing peace ambassadors for the whole of Nigeria. And one of the things that you, you have to recognize is the initiatives of maintaining peace and calm are not one time quick coming, blah, 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 blah. It, it doesn't work like that. It works with initiatives, with educating. It works with initiatives by um, bringing individuals like all of the peace ambassadors that we're mentoring and training throughout Nigeria and different regions. It works with regards to educating, setting up schools and, and universities and, and co-ed schools. And it is a whole long, it's a work that is continually in progress. That's why countries are party to the UN charter because they are part of that charter. And at any given point in time, you could have the USA, for example, sending aid and support to Nigeria for, for security. You have also the Queen's uh, security here in the United Kingdom, where they bring and they train security officers and the police forces. There's millions that are invested in training and, and equip, equipment. All of those are tools and tenants that are used by the United Nations agreement and resolutions to create some semblance of bringing about peace. So when you see upsurges and, and uprising, can the United Nations come in and make a rash decision? No, the United Nations does not go into a country and make a decision on its own. Decisions are made based on resolutions and agreements. When the United Nations shows up in your country, there are two times, uh, I would, there are many times, but one of the times might be a outcry of the people against the government, or one of the times might be a government's outcry against the atrocities that are happening among the people. So anytime you would hear of the United Nations intervention, there are, two, there are very many dynamics involved within the United Nations getting involved in those initiatives. Because remember, every single crime in your country is governed by local law, local or, or, or the law of your region. So for example, if somebody massacres a village, that's not the United Nations business. That's your police force business. And your police force is gonna manage it to the best of their ability. But if it gets to a place where that becomes overwhelming, and that's a, a national outcry that gets to the international ears, then it becomes something that international countries or partners or to the treaty will decide, hey, we need to look at how can we help Nigeria? How can we assist Nigeria? How could we assist Ghana, Malawi? How could we assist this country in this current crisis? So that's where you would have, they would either say they will send humanitarian aid, they will send armament, they will send peacekeeping forces, all of those things. But please be mindful that that's not a decision that the United Nations takes upon itself. The United Nations does not take any decision upon quote unquote itself. Everything is governed by laws and regulations and, and treaties and agreements and can do and cannot do. And equally, there are also things called vetoes. I hope you, you are aware of, of things called vetoes where some countries can decide not to assist. And if they veto something, then it doesn't happen. 
So, so all of these dynamics come into play when you are dealing with a country. Now, I want to tell you something very specific about Nigeria. I am going to tell you something specific about Nigeria um, for, for your knowledge. Nigeria is coming into some major changes um, as a result of the dynamics of the airspace is now open, treaties, agreements, and regulations are being made, and, 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 and a whole lot of things within the 2030 agenda for the African Union. Your leaders have a very difficult task in their hands because you have your leaders, some of them are looking to be better than others and proving they're better than others. And then the others that are trying to regain their seat and, and, and you're having a lot of internal chaos. But remember, you also have external shareholders and outside parties to your discussions and your negotiations that you also have to deal with. Can the United Nations just decide to intervene? No. Your people are gonna have to come to a place of forming a level of peace, working together. Your youth are gonna have to come to a youth agreement your women are going to have to come to a women's agreement. Your churches are going to have to come to an interfaith agreement. And as you continue to work together and foster and build those relationships, I personally believe that change could happen. So I hope that has answered your question to some degree, uh, Your Excellency Daniel. Please give me your feedback on my response. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very, very well understood. Thank you. I'm grateful. This, I just want to ask uh, uh, our brother Udemba, is he from Nigeria? Because that sounds Igbo. Your, your Excellency Udemba. Yes, I am from Nigeria. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would have gone a little bit further to ask from where? Like, <laughs> I'm from Abia State. Oh, that's great. I'm only from Abia State. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm very, uh, very happy to know you. I'm very happy to see you in the class of steel. And um, yeah. I believe we will not miss out. This is wonderful. Yeah. God bless you. you. Thank you, sir. Bless you too. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to call on Her Excellency Dr. Anita Davis before our our mommy and and our chief mentor and lecturer in the class of steel who's been quietly observing Your Excellency Dr. Defoe. Any thoughts on all that you've heard this evening? And, and you're going to be closing because you're the final one to share with us this evening. Dr. Anita Davis Defoe. For your excellency, uh, Bishop Dr. Michael Steele, to all the excellencies in the house, uh, visitors and, and uh, friends to the class of Steele, I bring you greetings uh, this afternoon from the U.S. Virgin Islands. I know for many of you, it is in the wee hours of the evening or late night. Um, I was listening intently to the discussion uh, which I, I agree with uh, some of the other excellencies. It was uh, timely, uh, it was highly informative, and it also points, you know, to the power of purpose, having, you know, purpose in, in your work. And when you are driven by purpose and you have your own personal whys, then you really stay focused on the, the greater good. I'm going to say something that as I was listening is burning, burning in my heart and spirit. And uh, I was hoping you would not call me because I was trying not to say this. But uh, since you did, I'm feeling compelled that I must be my authentic self. As I was listening to you share about how in some instances uh, people find conflicts between perhaps their their beliefs as a person of faith, or maybe uh, something that the UN is doing, your points about uh, the seven, uh, the seventeen uh, sustainable goals, uh, that's so on point because there is something that focuses on the work of everybody if they are, are focused on the greater good. That's one thing. 
The second thing is too often in organizations, whether it's a faith organization, a corporate or a community organization, the greater good gets put on the back burner and personal agendas, personal feelings, personal prejudices or stereotypical thinking derail the greater good. And I heard, you know, when you spoke to that about people who really have to look in the mirror and ask themselves the question, am I focused on the greater good? Am I a serve a leader and trying to serve others or am I trying to serve myself? That was the other thing as I was listening. But the other thing I wanted to share, and I say this and I can understand as a person, you know, of a faith and a minister there to you that uh, sometimes maybe the positions of the UN, maybe their approaches, you may have some challenges. But I must say as a uh, non-minister who has worked closely with a variety of entities in the faith community, most recently at a corporate office for one of the largest denominations in the world that's in some 128 countries with probably 30 to 50 million members with most of the members in, in, in particularly across the Caribbean and Africa with the members looking like the people that are in, this, in the circle tonight. When some of the rooms I sat in and some of the discussions I heard the disenfranchisement that I heard uh, for people that look like me and some of the rest of you on the call, I, it makes me question as a non-minister when I sometimes hear people out of the faith community say that they, they can't focus with an organization or they can't work with an organization because of their, their faith. And uh, my grandfather used to always say to me that uh, church is in the heart of man. And sometimes I have seen, especially when I'm working with these entities, that people who are supposed to be the leaders, that they are supposed to be leading the flock, that the malice and uh, the backbiting and the personal agendas that I, have, that I saw in their heart, I must say as a lay person working in those environments, it was quite frightening. So when I hear people, uh, kind of confused about working with the UN and not saying that there may not be some personal agendas brought there too, because because that's human nature. Sometimes depending on people's mindset, that's how they function. But what I have found is when you focus on the greater good and when you truly trying to save and help people, then you can get past that and you can focus on peace because too often and as I said, this has been a, as a lay person working with a variety of denominations that I'm not going to call any of them out. But I'm saying in many instances, and I've said this to the faith leaders that I was working with at the time, I said, I'm really appalled at the, the behaviors of people that are supposed to be serving leaders in the kingdom, the way they treat each other, the way they treat their members, the way they treat uh, different uh, groups based upon a skin color, a mindset, it was very appalling to me and frightening because I'm like, if this is the behaviors I'm observing and this is how you carry on, how, how are you going to help people grow in greater faith? Are you really serving God in the kingdom? Or are you serving yourself? So people, I think often, and I think your, your lesson tonight was well on, on point, because a lot of people, uh, because they're not clear about the UN, have a lot of misconceptions about it. And as Hosea 4 and 6 says, you know, people perish for the lack of knowledge. And so when people don't know, and they think they know, and what they know, they turn it into fact, when indeed it's often fiction, that is a dangerous scenario. So I think your point, and I think this was timely and uh, it made sense to do it so that if people have any questions that they're clear about the work of the, the UN and not saying that there's uh, not some, uh, maybe some unscrupulous leaders that are part of the UN, that's everywhere. And as I said, I've seen them in corporate America. I've seen it in churches. I've seen it everywhere. And during my stint, my last stint 
with um, this major denomination, if I had closed my eyes and forgot where I was, I would have thought I was in corporate America in a boardroom seeing some of the behaviors that I've seen. So I just say, as you said to them, Your Excellency Bishop Steele, walk your own truth. Walk your own authentic core values. Stay focused on the greater good. Don't get swept up, swept up in the negativity because if you can be the best you and if you serve with uh, authority, if you serve for the greater good, uh, for God, if that, and that's what you say and you do, you won't be led, led astray. But when these other agendas, when these other mindsets, when you let them invade into your space, into your work, then we get derailed. So that's my my take on the sharing and the, the feedback that I heard, you know, a lot of the excellencies and some of the people that are visiting the class share about people wondering, well, what is this? Is this legitimate? What does the UN do? Uh, what, who do they, you know, who do they serve? What, how do they, you know, serve? Um, this, does this conflict with my, my Christianity? And I'm saying it shouldn't because in, if you're doing work for the kingdom of God or the UN, if you should be focused on doing good doing good for the least of these. And if that's the focus, how can it be bad? And I'm gonna stop there because this is something that that is near and dear to my heart because I'm telling you the conflicts that I have felt and seen doing consulting in the faith community has very saddened me because I I have seen so many people Mm -hmm. talking a talk, but they certainly not walking that walk and how they have, they have behaving and how they're treating, you know, people and their own, uh, you know, agendas. It has been very, very sad. And I have seen that for over the last 15 years. And so this is Anita Davis Defoe, and I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Dr. Defoe, I, I listen to you passionately because I, I want to, um, I, I'm a bishop. And, and, and as a bishop, I want to say something very, very important. I, I cannot speak for other bishops or other leaders. I would never try to do that. But I also want to, on the behalf of some, if I should use that term, I, I want to apologize for, for our, our, our behavior. Because when you're raised like I was from my youth as a Christian, um, I, I was raised in Barbados under a Christian environment, and a lot of times we just we just operate in the world according to our paradigm. We just operate according to our our teaching, our exposure, and and for me, coming to the UK was was an eye opener, and and I'm changing. I'm I'm I don't want to use the word evolving, but I'm changing and becoming more tolerant. I'm becoming more humane. I'm becoming more humanitarian um, continually. And, and, I, and I've been becoming that for the past 10 or 15 years as a young man. And, and it has been a journey because a lot of times we have to unlearn a lot of the things that we have learned. And, and then we have to now, in as much as we are unlearning, we also have to function with the criticism of those that, that, that were some of our teachers and are closest to us while we are learning and trying to learn. So it's a, it's a process that can be very challenging. Mm-hmm. And, and I will be honest with you as well, Dr. Defoe, I have this walk that I walk as a mentor, it has really, it, 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 has, become a, it, it has become a who I am. I am, I am what I do. I, I walk, I walk everywhere with a level of professionalism. I go everywhere. I, I'm always not on edge. I don't walk on edge. I have a very joyful, buzzing, exciting life. But what I want to say is that every moment of my life is, is focused on the fact that I'm a global representative. I'm a representative for the United Nations about peace building. I'm a bishop as a Christian. And I'm also a husband and and, and a father. 
So, so I, I think a lot of individuals just put on hats on Sunday and they behave like that on Sunday. They put on hats in meetings and they behave like that in the meeting rather than mm -hmm. just be themselves all the time. And, mm -hmm. and I am myself all the time and I'm very comfortable in my skin. And I think that in this dispensation, a lot of ministers are recognizing we're going to have to be now coming together for a common good and a higher good. So the onus is on us, Dr. Defoe, to love them, appreciate them, allow them the right to feel the way they feel, but hopefully create an environment where we hope that they see what we're trying to teach them and it adds value to them and they want to implement it to their lives and make sure that we don't get stuck down the path of behaving the way that they behave. Because equally, it is easy for us to show the same manner of disgust and behavior that others might look and say, oh my goodness, but Dr. Steele is behaving the same way. So we just have to be monitoring ourselves and, and stay focused and keep teaching your excellency because that's the best tool we have to keep teaching. And, and I was listening. Local leaders must, must. Go ahead. I was listening for your response. That's why, Paul. Oh, I, oh, I was saying that uh, as global leaders, we have to seek to learn uh, each and every day. And we all are impacted by our environments, um, whether family environments, our community environments, who raised us. But if we stop and think, you know, especially if you're working in the kingdom that you're supposed to be for good. And so we often confuse the, the, the dislike of behaviors to the dislike of a group of people. And so we have to be clear, you know, yes, you, you know, you may not like Anita Davis Defoe's behavior in some way, but that doesn't mean, okay, so everybody that looks like me, you know, is a bad person person and many times we grab hold on to you know to that that dislike instead of you know being uh, dismayed at the be you know the behavior and so that's just something that we have to work on and learn because I have found that when you are focused on good and it doesn't matter whether if you in the faith community the corporate community uh, your home good is good and it's when we're not focused on the good that we, you know, that we lose it. And if you are true to yourself, as you said, and you are really uh, acknowledging and marching to your, your values, it doesn't matter what kind of environment you go in. So whether you're in the church, you're in the corporate world or whatever. But what it is is so many times we wear masks. Uh, we wear different hats, as you said. So when I'm with the church crew, I'm saying this. When I'm at the, you know, the community. And so when you do that, after a while, you wore so many hats and wore so many faces, you're confused. So you don't know who you are. So, but when you become your authentic self and you walk in, the, in that, you know, in that truth, then you're, you're able to, you know, to sustain it and you're comfortable in your own skin. And a lot of people are not able to, you know, to do that. So I just applaud, I applaud the feedback that you got from everybody in the class and for you giving uh, this, you know, this information, because I do think it was timely, not only for us as, as peace ambassadors to understand our role, but just really mindset, because so much about leading is mindset. And so you're talking, you were talking about that this, this evening or this afternoon uh, about what kind of mindset and heart are you bringing to the work? And I think that was quite, quite valuable. So I, I salute you and uh, all, everybody in the class still in this old discussion dialogue. Well, I want to I want to bring this discussion to a close. Thank you so very much. I do apologize that we've really gone on beyond our our time schedule. We've really gone on, but the dialogue and the feedback was wonderful. It was welcome. It was engaging, and I want to appreciate all of you on the YouTube, the LinkedIn, and our Facebook page who listened in this evening on the broadcast. And I look forward to you joining us on. Wednesday, when we are going to go into part two, and then we will have discussion on part two of this discussion on the same time on Wednesday. 
I'm Dr. Michael Steele. Uh, my wife, Her Excellency Jeannie Steele, who sits in the background monitoring to watch what we're doing, His Excellency Donald Ewers, Her Excellency Dr. Anita Davis before, and all of you who represent your country within the class of Steele and your organization. Thank you so very much for being with us. And we look forward to hearing you and seeing you on Wednesday. And please be mindful that on Friday, her Excellency Dr. Anita Davis before will be bringing her presentation to you on Friday as usual. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you. Good night and God bless you. Thank you so very much for being with us.